So good evening. Uh, my name is Rich Bazillo, and I'm the executive director of the New England Hemophilia Association. And we're really excited tonight to have our guest speaker, Colette, who will be sharing a lot about accumulator adjusters. So as we navigate this pandemic together, NEHA started the, uh, our webinar Wednesday series in March. And the primary reason for doing that is to keep our community connected and the families that we serve. Um, the goal is also to keep you informed in a virtual space. This is a special webinar, it's Thursday, although it probably feels like a Wednesday, Monday, or maybe even Saturday at this point. Um, but as I mentioned, tonight is all about accumulator adjusters. So accumulator adjusters um, programs allow PBMs, which, are, which is pharmacy benefit managers, to draw down the value of the manufacturer assistance card while still requiring the patient to pay co-pays and other out-of-pocket expenses. Um, so tonight's program will help you learn more about these programs, what to do if your insurance company implements one, um, and to ask questions to Colette and to others. For many of us who have been on Zoom, um, you now are experts, so you know how to do this stuff. You could turn your camera on, you could turn your camera off. We encourage you to use the chat instead of unmuting yourself. The chat is a great way to ask questions. I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll ask all questions to Colette at the end of the presentation. This presentation is being recorded, so if you don't want to be on screen, just turn your camera off and you could still participate. Um, before we get going, it wouldn't be a NEHA presentation if we didn't do some live polling. So if you've never done this before, grab your phone. You're going to need your phone and I'll go through exactly how to do this. So I'll give you a second to grab your phone and I'll pull the magic of um, polling up on my screen. So one second here. All right. All right, so the first one has nothing to do with accumulator adjusters. Um, it's eggnog or hot cider or neither. So what you do is you text to 781-412-7971 and you'll be able to put your um, thought in here. So for those on the phone, eggnog or neither is definitely winning. Um, hot cider is a third, but let's give it another second here and see what happens. So it looks like eggnog is definitely, whoa, whoa, whoever just joined, there's, there's a lot of love for eggnog right now. 63% for eggnog and maybe Michael in, in the background um, who, who's putting these votes in because he does love his eggnog as soon as it comes out in September or October. All right, let's go on to the next one. We asked this last night during the webinar and I'm interested to see what this is. So if you were on last night, you will notice this one, but I just love to see where, where people are. So which one would you pick to watch? Elf, The Polar Express, Home Alone, or The Grinch? So text one for Elf, text two for The Polar Express, text three for Home Alone, and text four for The Grinch. So, um, and then I'll share the result of, of uh, what happened last night too. So it looks like Elf is definitely winning, followed by a tie of Home Alone and The Grinch. And come on, The Polar Express, such a classic. It's like, it's not Christmas or the holidays without The Polar Express. I'm gonna vote just so I could get that up. Ready? Boom, there you go. 12%. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so it looks like the Elf won. It didn't win by as much of a majority like last night. But um, so Elf, The Grinch, followed by Home Alone, then The Polar Express. So now we're going to transition into accumulated adjusters here. So do you or your child use a manufacturer copay assistance program? Text one to yes, two for no, three, I don't know. If you are on Medicare or Medicaid, this um, a co-payment assistance program does not apply to you. So just put, I don't know. I meant to add another, um, another option there, but just put, I don't know. And that will give us a good idea. Um, if I didn't mention this, we don't track any of your information. So I, you know, we're not gonna go in and track these numbers. To you. Um, but so for those on the phone, uh, it looks like 60% say yes they or their child uses a copay assistance program. 33% um, said no, and about 7% said I don't know, or they're not eligible to use it. All right, let's go on to the next question here. Have you or your child 
been affected by an accumulator adjuster? Yes, protects one. Two, protects uh, for no. Three, for I don't know. Or four, doesn't apply. And that would be if you're Medicare or Medicaid. Okay, great, thank you, Colette. Mm -hmm. So it looks like for those on the phone, we have no is about 65%. We have 11% that said yes, and 25% say it doesn't apply. So thank you for that. A couple more questions here. Um, do you understand what an accumulator adjuster is? Text one for yes, two for no, and three, you don't know. And if you don't know, it's okay, because that's why you're on the webinar tonight. <laughs> Uh, so let's see. Let's just give it a couple of seconds here. So it looks like we have, um, well, yes was ahead, but it's going down. Um, it looks like yes is about 50% followed by not sure is 40% uh, and followed by no. So we'll just uh, give it, okay, there we go. So yeah, it looks like I'm not sure in yes is, is right in line followed by no. All right. All right. And let me stop sharing there. So with that said, it is my, let me spotlight you, Colette. So you can be, it's like a, hey, it's like yeah. a TV show here. You're right next to me. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is my pleasure to have Colette Koulianos from the National Hemophilia Foundation. Did I say it right? Yep. Oh, great. Yeah, I've been practicing. She uh, told me I could call her Colette the cool cat, too. Yeah. Um, so I went, with her, <laughs> I, went, I, I went with her um, official name here, who is the Senior Director of Payer Relations at the National Hemophilia Foundation. So, Colette, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. I have to, before I say one thing, I'm going to tell you, if this drink was on that, that poll, I think it would have won. Maybe not today, but if you write this recipe down, and then I want, I'm challenging you to ask this question on the next one. It's called a, a warm blueberry tea. So you use Ooh. red rose tea bag or an orange pico. It's a hot drink, but it's amazing. One shot of amaretto, one shot of... Oh, shoot. Oh, no. Hang on one second. I, have, I can't do this right now. What's in the... Little Little did you know you're going to get a bartending lesson tonight as well. Okay. Amaretto, one shot of amaretto, one shot of Grand Meunier. Ooh. And then you put that into the tea, and you can put a cinnamon stick in it just because it looks pretty. I promise you, it's crazy how that tastes like blueberry. In Canada, it's a big, big drink in Canada, and they call it like a warm blueberry hug, but it is amazing. So I dare you guys to try it and then see if that doesn't top that list next time. I love it. Well, I think I know what our next virtual session is going to be. Never mind a cookie class here. Yeah. All right, Colette, I'm going to turn it over to you okay. now. So, yeah, my name is Colette Koulianis, Senior Director of Payer Relations at the National Hemophilia Foundation, as Rich said. I've been with NHF for five years uh, here at um, the beginning of the year. My role at NHF is to, uh, I'm responsible for project leadership, um, analysis and development of our payer education strategies, policies, and programs, including our Comprehensive Care Sustainability Collaborative, otherwise known as CCSD. Um, prior to my time at NHF, I did run a hemophilia treatment center in Peoria, Illinois, uh, the Bleeding Clotting Disorder Institute. So I have had many years uh, working closely with the bleeding clotting disorder community. I do not have a bleeding and clotting disorder, nor do I have a family member that has one, but I am as passionate, I would say, as probably most uh, in the community. And um, I lose sleep over trying to fight for the issues that this community faces. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Sorry, let me make sure I pull up the uh, proper screen and go to starting this. But are you guys on the yep so are you seeing like with the outline on the side as well yes okay is that perfect. better yep perfect all righty so without further ado this is a few things that i am going to review i'm going to talk just very little about some payer um, related uh, insurance challenges but i'm really going to focus that on the a copay accumulator adjusters, and there's also another 
um, program that's been implemented called uh, variable copay programs or copay maximizer programs. So it's important to understand, first of all, what the U.S. payer mix is so that you can kind of get your hands around just where this kind of issue focuses and where the potential risk of being impacted by a copay accumulator adjuster is. So in our country, sorry, I don't know why that Florida stat is on the bottom of that screen, um, but in the U.S., we're just looking at the U.S. line, 49.6%, the latest data um, show in 2019 show 49.6% have employer sponsored insurance, which means their employer pay for some part of the premium. So you share the premium cost with your employer. Then you have non-group, which is an like individual on the marketplace um, or family on the marketplace. You have Medicaid, Medicare, military, uninsured. That's the mix made up over the US. Now accumulator adjusters are gonna affect people in the first two come the employer or the non-group um, is where the potential is. It does not impact Medicaid, Medicare, um, or the military plans. Obviously, it wouldn't impact uninsured. Um, of the un of the employer sponsored the non-group, so you have you know nearly 56 percent almost of folks. So the largest chunk of folks are on commercial insurance. Um, that's private insurance. And of that, the makeup is nearly 70 percent of all that is self-funded employers, meaning the company uses an insurance company like United Healthcare or Blue Cross Blue Shield or Cigna or Aetna, they use them to administer their benefits and um, use their, their network, but they are the ones responsible and obligated for the claims. And so uh, it's important to understand that because if you're on a plan that's self-funded, they don't have to abide by the ACA guidelines um, that are currently in place. So, so they're governed by ERISA, it's a federal legislation over them, and so they have the ability to do things differently. They don't have to cover drugs, period, if they don't want to. They can carve out specialty drugs, they can carve out orphan drugs, and so they have that capability. So it's been important work that I've done at NHF is trying to help these plans keep costs contained so that they won't make that decision um, because, you know, we are a very high-cost community. So then we have COVID and it kind of impacted up, upheaval uh, to the insurance mix. So prior to uh, COVID, I, I gave you the stats. Since COVID, we know that uh, newly uninsured due to employer-sponsored insurance loss, this was as of late May or early May, I'm sorry, was 26.8 million people lost employer-sponsored insurance. It may not have been permanent. It could be that they were on a, you know, a temporary type of layoff situation but we know there's been a huge impact to the percentages. There's some companies out there who suggest that we have now, instead of the mix that I gave earlier, that it's more like a third, a third, a third. So a third commercial, a third Medicaid, third Medicare. Um, but we know it's had an impact. Uh, largely when they lose their employer sponsored insurance, because remember the largest part of that is self-funded, they would either have the option of going on Medicaid if you're in a Medicaid expansion state or they would go on the marketplace. And because the marketplace is governed by ACA, that's kind of renewed our focus on um, working on anti-accumulator language because they can't put accumulator adjusters if there's some state legislation because they are governed by the state. So we ask uh, employers, what is their, their key strategies to contain healthcare costs? Because the US is the number one high cost per capita country in the world, almost double that of any other country of its kind, and actually has less um, positive outcomes as some of those countries that are significantly lower per capita cost, uh, meaning longer life expectancies or less uh, chronic disease. So it's really been a focus um, for several years, but over the last at least three or four years, and moving into the next three to five years, the strategy has been let's focus on high cost claimants and how we can try to help uh, make a cost, uh, you know, reduce our costs. What is a high cost claimant? You're probably asking. Well, it's anybody who costs $50,000 or more a year to the health plan would be identified as a high cost claimant. If you take all the high cost claimants and put them in a, in a pool, and you get a median um, uh, cost, it's $122,382 annually. 
So all the high cost claimants combined uh, averaged are 122,382. If you look specifically at hemophilia, we're somewhere around 300,000 or more. A year is the average for an adult. So we're significantly higher than the high cost claimant. So even just the high cost claimant, the average is 29.3 times higher than the average uh, patient who's not a high cost claimant, average member. And only 1.2% of people in the country are high cost claimants, and yet they make up 31% of the spend. And if you take it a step further, 6% make up like 87% of the spend. So of course, payers are gonna focus on those who are taking most of their money on when it comes to healthcare spend. And hemophilia is in that bracket. You see we top the list, uh, third is blood disease. So what do they do? Well, traditionally they deploy one size fits all type of strategies. They do prior, uh, utilization management. You may not have heard of every one of these, but you've probably had prior authorization. You've been impacted by having to get prior authorization before you get your meds, pre-approval, pre-certification. It's known as step therapy or fail first, where they um, tell you you have to try this drug and fail on it before you can get to this drug. Um, there's quantity limits they may place uh, on various medications. And then of course the copay accumulator adjustment programs and maximizer programs are two of the later, more common uh, recent strategies deployed. So where are we with copay accumulators and maximizers? They rolled out in 2016. As you heard Rich say, PBMs uh, started this uh, trend. They told the employers who were sitting here scratching their head going, how do we lower our costs for these high cost claimants? And they came forth and said, do you realize that the highest cost patients out there are using manufacturer assistance as the way to pay their out-of-pocket costs so they have no skin in the game and they're getting the highest cost drugs instead of the generics. And so they don't care. They don't care how much it costs you. And of course, this erupted employers were very angry to learn that that was happening. And that's where these began, the copay accumulators. Um, we know there's no generic with hemophilia, by the way, but that's the, the, the story that was uh, told. So we're, we run into this problem is a lot of people don't have an understanding of even basic healthcare literacy. So we know that folks um, largely know that a premium is what you pay to get your insurance. So if you're an employer-sponsored plan, that means your employer pays some part of your premium, you pay a part of your premium. The premium does not count to your out-of-pocket. It's what it costs to get your insurance. What does count to your annual out-of-pocket is your deductible, any co-pays, and co-insurance. That equals your out-of-pocket. Now, every year we have a max out-of-pocket set by ACA. This coming year, it's $8,550 for an individual, double that for a family. So if you have a deductible on your plan, and about 85% of plans have a deductible, if you have a deductible, you have to understand you must pay the entire deductible in its full before the plan will start paying even the first penny. So your deductible can be from a few hundred dollars. It can go all the way up to $7,000 this coming year. If your deductible is over $1,400, that's called a high deductible health plan. Um, and so uh, the average deductible is um, in the, uh, depending on which sector of folks, but um, on marketplace plans, it's somewhere around $4,000. On other uh, uh, and fully funded commercial plans, I see, I've seen data around the $1,800 range. But in any event, you have to pay that entire deductible before the plan pays the first penny. And then after you pay the deductible, you start paying coinsurance and co-pays. Coinsurance is a split amount you pay with your, ins with your um, uh, insurer. So if you're on an 80-20 split, they would pay 80% after you hit your deductible, you pay 20, and then you continue to pay co-pays until you hit your max out of pocket. Every plan has different maxes. They come in different flavors and sizes. The max max for an individual, as I mentioned, is 8,550 um, for an individual double for a family. So taking the information I've said to you already, what an accumulator adjustment program is, is it says, you can use the coupon, as you heard Rich say at the beginning, you can use the copay, manufacturer copay assistance card like you have been. But instead of you use that card when you go to get your drug and that pays down your deductible and your copays and your coinsurance and helps you meet your max out of pocket, they're saying you can keep using the card until, you, until there's no more benefit left on it. 
but it's no longer going to count to your out-of-pocket. It won't count to your max out-of-pocket. It won't count to your deductible co-pays or co-insurance. So that's where kind of the, the, the situation can become desperate for a lot of folks um, because people don't just have those kind of dollars sitting around. Um, a copay maximizer, I, I'll get into the definition when I come up further um, on the uh, spreadsheet because it'll be easier for me to explain. So I'm going to save that one. But, it, but so remember I said that we have a problem just understanding basic, basic health care terms like deductible, co-insurance, co-pay, and max out-of-pocket. And that's less than 9% of the population even have a basic understanding of those terms. So what makes this even more confusing is when a plan puts one of these co-pay accumulator adjusters in, they name them misleading names. Like Express Scripts calls it the out-of-pocket protection program. Now, tell me if that doesn't sound like a benefit to you. An out-of-pocket benefit protection program sounds like a good thing. Or Caremark calls it a true accumulation or United Healthcare Coupon Adjustment Benefit Plan Protection Program. So again, these names, they don't sound like a bad thing. And so if a member gets a notice that they're gonna implement an out-of-pocket protection program, the member goes, this is a great deal. It sounds like they're gonna protect my out-of-pocket. Um, so I, I went through these already. Um, so if, if you're a high deductible health plan, that's the bottom line there. $7,000 is the max your deductible could be for an individual. 14000 for your family. You can put money in an HSA or a health savings account, which is pre-tax, but you can only put in this coming year, you can only put in a max of 3600 for an individual or 7200 for a family, far short of what the, the deductible could be. And you cannot access your HSA until the full money is saved. So again, another uh, problem. And with um, all other plans, the max out of pocket is 8550 17,100 for um, a family. So I say the dollars and cents don't add up and I didn't spell cents wrong. I meant to spell it that way. So the median household income in the US is $68,703. That was in 2019. We know that 49% of Americans recently um, surveyed uh, said that they have had a loss of income due to COVID. So this number will have a um, changed as a result of COVID, but last year was 68,703 was the median household income. So we have a max out of pocket of eight, 8,550 for an individual, 17,100 for a family. On top of that, you got your premiums, you got your house, your kids, your car, your school, your clothes, your food. And we look at the median household income. It does not add up. People do not have that kind of money. Um, just laying aside, I have a $7,000 deductible to meet every year. Um, so they do surveys, Bankrate did a survey saying, what would you do if you had a $1,000 emergency, medical, unexpected medical expense? And, and here's the answers, the, prime, the, the number one answer was 41% say they would have to pull the, the cost from their savings. And then the remainder of answers um, are talk about either financing with a credit card, borrowing money, don't know what they would do, um, or have to cut spending on something else. Again, this is before COVID. So we know that the numbers are or even more critical today. Today, um, we know that almost 60% uh, of covered lives, that's commercial covered, I'm, remember Medicaid and Medicare are not affected, but uh, almost 60% of covered lives currently have a copay accumulator adjustment program on their plan. And we know that um, there's additional um, interest from companies and in rolling out copay accumulators. So we expect that the number is going to continue to rise. So if you haven't been impacted, there's a chance you could be. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have to think about um, all the, the potential uh, caveats, especially when you're picking a plan to determine even if by, you know, choosing, most people look at plans and they look at the cost of the premium only. So especially if you lost employment due to COVID and you went to go on the marketplace, that means you've had a loss of income. So you're going to be looking at the, the, the cheapest possible option for health plan. But the lower the premium, the higher the out-of-pocket. So there's a direct correlation with the cost of the premium to the uh, money out-of-pocket. So it might behoove you to look at a, a higher premium. And instead of going with the high deductible health plan, going with a PPO or an EPO where you're limited on your exposure, and it, you'll net ahead at the end of the year. <clears throat> so 
Um, I helped start the All Co-Pays Count Coalition. We have six member organizations that are on the steering committee and there's almost 80 um, member organizations now across the country. Um, we are united in our belief that copay accumulated adjustment programs impede access to care and we urge measures to assure that copay assistance count towards a health plan enrollee's annual deductible or out of pocket. And, um, and, and we're working together to try to collect data to help uh, you know, get um, uh, legislative change both on a federal and state level. And I noticed that my colleague, Marian uh, Goldstein is on from HFA and, um, and she works very uh, closely with us on this and, and also a great resource. So I did wanna make sure I mentioned that. Um, so the, we had news that the first medical, uh, so up until today, the only uh, plans that were affected is if you got your medication on the pharmacy benefit. Now it didn't mean every single one with a pharmacy benefit implemented a copay accumulator, but that was the only place they implemented them. In October, we had gotten news that uh, effective January 1, uh, United Healthcare was going to roll out the copay accumulator adjustment program on the medical benefit, and they were going to depend on the provider, the physician, to attest to the fact that you used the copay card. Because otherwise, there's no way to identify if you used a copay card. So they were going to put the onus on the provider. Um, we jumped up uh, on that. I know many disease groups across the country, AMA, American Medical Association, providers across the country, we responded with a very heavy resounding uh, voice and they decided to hold off on implementation for now. So that's where we're at today on that one in case you had heard about it. Um, in April of uh, 2019, we had some progress we made with the um, CMS and CSIO. They're the folks that um, issue the national benefit and payment parameters guidelines for what plans have to do on the marketplace. And they can also um, uh, make decisions that would affect ERISA plans as well. So in April of 2019, they put out the NBPP 2020 saying that uh, starting in 2020, no health plan could implement a copay accumulator adjustment program if there was no generic. That was short-lived. By August of 2019, it was walked back because the people who are proponents of accumulator adjustment programs, shock, shock, the PBMs and, and other folks out there, the plans, the health plans, um, they um, had a louder voice and deeper pockets, and so it was walked back. And we have since been working with um, federal legislators trying to um, get them to reverse back to that decision. Uh, today, the way the rule stands, NBPP 2021 says that any plan can put on an accumulator adjustment program if they want to. Um, we do have some legislation, which I'll get into here in a minute. Um, there's a, so when they did that NBPP 2021, there were 72 members of the U.S. House of Representatives calling on U the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Secretary Azar, to drop the anti patient insurance rules contained in the 2021 benefit protection payment parameters that applied to the, especially the copay accumulator adjustment. Um, and then there's also this House Bill 7647 that currently today has 30, uh, 37, I believe, bipartisan uh, signers that are asking um, to delay implementation of the new rule, the NBPP 2021, and go back to the 2020, the one I told you about, the good the good news one, um, and have them go back to that until a year after the COVID crisis ends. So we are asking uh, if you have any connection with any federal uh, legislators to ask them to support this legislation. This is really key because this impacts all health plans on the marketplace and ERISA plans. So that's self-funded employer plans. Um, this goes back to the data um, about the, the swing in, in coverage. Now, there have been some states that have implemented anti-accumulator adjustment programs. I've been working with Rich and uh, folks from other disease groups and trying to get um, um, the, you have to remind me who the gentleman's name is, Rich, that we've um, been working with. In, in, in Rhode Island? Rhode Island. Senator uh, Miller? Yep, Senator Miller. Um, but currently, Illinois, Virginia, West Virginia, 
their anti-accumulator language, there, so there's six uh, current um, anti-accumulator bills. Um, these three states have the, the most uh, coverage, if you will. They say no accumulator adjustment programs, period. Um, the model language here you see is from Illinois' bill. Arizona says no copay accumulator adjustment program if there's no generic, which is very similar to what the NBPP rule was. And, and then Georgia implemented no accumulator adjustment programs if there's no generic. But they also go on to say that you don't have to accept manufacturer assistance, that you can decide not to accept any assistance at all. Um, but that, would be, that wouldn't be in their best interest, and I'll explain that here in just a second. And then the most recent is Puerto Rico. Um, they just implemented a, an anti-accumulator bill. We are working with, as, um, as Rich just said, Rhode Island, but we're also um, working with South Carolina and Ohio and Michigan and Florida and Mississippi. Um, I'm working with folks in, in all of those states and, as well as helped with these other states to get legislation passed. Um, NHF uh, uh, got a, a survey that was, uh, uh, was fielded by the um, POS, which is Public Opinion Strategies, and it was a survey sent out to American voters. So you had to be 18 or older to answer the survey, and you had to be a registered voter. And so what we were looking for was to kind of get the uh, sentiment from the public on whether they thought the federal government should mandate that this money counts to a patient's out of pocket. And here were the key takeaways of the survey. The most important health care problem voters wanted to address today is the cost of health insurance premiums. However, it's clear that lowering premium costs cannot be resolved by increasing deductibles and other higher out of pocket costs. More than four in 10 voters with chronic health conditions say they or someone in their household has not been able to afford their out of pocket in the past year. The majority of voters across both parties said that they believe the federal government should require that assistance to count to patient out of pocket. And, and what was also very telling was that almost two thirds of the respondents uh, did not have a chronic condition, that no chronic condition, but 81% of the respondents thought that the government should count the money. So it wasn't just people who had a chronic disease who feel like the money should be counted, it's all voters. And why is that important? Because every time I hear somebody who's, who's for copay cumulative adjustment programs, they say, you think it's fair to George Doe and, and Jim Doe when John Doe gets to use a coupon to meet his out-of-pocket, but they don't? Um, they don't think that's fair. But that's not how the American public feels. And so this was very important, and we've used it to um, reach out to legislators both on a state and federal level, and we'll continue to do so. We're also rolling out a patient survey. But here's uh, just some of, the, some of the key data. Again, I said 86% believe that it should be counted. Um, and across uh, all voters, it was 86%. Uh, Republicans, you see here the numbers, uh, independents and Democrats. So very clear, um, it was, it was uh, something that is agreed to by all parties. And they believe that there's significant consequences, negative consequences, by not counting the copay assistance um, towards the members out of pocket. They could no longer be able to afford their medicines was the number one answer. Significantly increase chronic disease patients out of pocket costs, result in many chronic disease patients stopping their treatments. Um, and so, you know, it was very positive to see that, again, people who didn't have a chronic disease felt the same passion about the issue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, should I, I can stop for some questions now, um, and then I can go into giving you an example so I can walk you through it. I think it helps kind of um, pull it all together. So Rich, do you have any questions as of now? Oh, I hope you're up to bat because I'm going to throw some at you. Yay. <laughs> um, and please keep putting them in the chat here. Um, so I'm going to stop at the top. Uh, and I'm going to read them as is. And if we need more clarification, I may ask you to unmute yourself. So the first question, Colette, is do you have the high cost for hemophilia and HIV combined? I think that was to a earlier slide. No. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, I know we're recording this, but can the slides be made available? Absolutely. Okay, great. So far, you uh, hit two home runs. Let's see if you can go for three. Um, uh, 
All right, so this one's interesting because I believe some manufacturers do do this. So the question is, could the coupon be paid to the patient versus the insurance company, allowing the patient to still use it to go towards the cost, cost of the deductible? It's hard to pay up front for some patients, but could that help? Well, it is happening, so I'll tell you that. Um, right when this whole thing first started, we started to see this exact, um, exactly what you're asking, whoever asked that question, where either manufacturers were saying, you pay it and then we'll reimburse you, or even the PBMs, interesting, they're the ones who got employers to implement these, but then they realized that this is, and the way they do it is they get exclusivity to their wholly owned pharmacies that they own, because you know most PBMs own their own pharmacy. Um, but then they realize they're losing revenue to the pharmacy, so they're trying to help the patient on the back end beat it. It was just a way to get exclusivity to their pharmacy. The, um, the only thing we were concerned with from the beginning on this is, would this have any financial implication to our patients? Meaning, would they somehow get a 1099 at the end of the year? Would that be taxable income? Could it affect maybe not only their taxable income, but other um, uh, support that they're getting? Even if the answer to all those questions is no, it's not, taxable income and it wouldn't hurt. We do know that some employers have caught wind of that behavior because we've heard of a handful of folks that have gotten attestation letters from their employer. They had to swear that they didn't get any remuneration on the back end to help uh, with their out-of-pocket costs. And so at that time, the members left with either lying, which of course I'm never going to recommend, or telling the truth and happen to pay the money back or potentially lose their insurance. So not, a, not the ultimate uh, solution for NHF. We want to make these go away. Um, but would I want you not to do it if it meant you couldn't get your meds? Absolutely not. I just want to make sure you're aware that there could be some repercussions um, of that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Colette. Mm -hmm. um, really good information there. Um, another question is, what effect does this have on drug manufacturers? Aren't they making money from encouraging people to buy brand name drugs to get their copays? Why don't lawmakers um, ban on these? Well, they, so they're, that's exactly what they're trying to do. What you have to understand is these are not the coupons you see in your Sunday paper for drugs like Lipitor or Crestor, where you can go and buy the generic Crestor and pay a $5 copay because it's on the lowest tier of your plan. Or I can look in the uh, Sunday paper and I can get a Crestor coupon and I can now take the Crestor, which would normally cost me, let's say 150, and I can make it only $5 by handing in the coupon. Now that is absolutely something I don't support because now the health plan, your, your, your company is paying much higher so that you can get the brand name instead of the generic, which acts absolutely circumvents the intention of their plan design. These copay accumulators are on specialty drugs. They're not on those cheaper drugs. They're on the high cost specialty drugs. And 87% of the specialty drugs that are targeted do not have a generic. And every hemophilia product has a coupon. So yes, they're all expensive. And yes, some are a little more than others, but they're all high cost, every one of our products. So since they're available for every product, it's not driving patients to only the highest cost product. It's helping patients as a lifeline to be able to receive their, their life and death treatments. So. Thank you, Colette. Mm -hmm. Another question um, that came in is a really good question. Who makes the decision on whether a drug is medical or pharmacy? The plan or so if, if it's one of the self-funded plans I told you about, which is the majority of commercial plans, they use companies, as I said, like United or Cigna or whatever, to help implement their plan. And they will usually follow the way they run their plan. Although the employer in that case can make override any determination because they're the ones ultimately paying the bill. Um, but the plan is usually the one that decides where uh, the benefit will lie. Pharmacy benefit man managers have been arguing for several years since back when I was at the treatment center that the only way to really manage the cost of high cost drugs is to make sure they're all on the pharmacy benefit so that um, you can get uh, more real time data. The problem is they aren't sharing any um, data with purchasers of healthcare with the people paying the bills that's actually relevant or shows 
any transparent data, they're showing high level fluff data, truly. Um, so uh, while in theory that might be true and it's worked to get more uh, payers to move it over to the pharmacy benefit, there's been some unintended consequences like this to our patient community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this one came in as a private message as well is with the United Healthcare's decision to implement then rescind, how will this affect other um, big insurance companies as well? Will they follow suit? Well, United Healthcare, so this was implemented at first by pharmacy benefit managers. And then we started seeing insurance plans also implement them. So over the last four years, it's both. It's insurance plans and pharmacy benefit managers. Three, uh, almost three years ago, United Healthcare, it would have been, well, two full plan years. Um, United Healthcare rolled this out already on their pharmacy benefit. So if you get any, if you're on United Healthcare and you have to use Briova, their specialty pharmacy that they own, um, and that's on the back of your card, you have to use Briova, they've already implemented Accumulator likely on most of those plans. Um, if you're on that same United plan, and now speaking specifically about hemophilia, if you get your product from your hemophilia treatment center instead of Briova, so there is about 21 centers that I'm aware of that have a, a United Healthcare contract. And so they can serve, even though it's a pharmacy benefit, they have the ability to serve the clotting factor on the medical benefit because of this contract, then the accumulator adjustment doesn't apply. So if it has impacted you because you have to use Briova and you could use your HTC, you might want to look into that because you could um, not have to be impacted by the accumulator. But when that happened with United Healthcare, they were one of the later ones to roll out the pharmacy benefit um, implementation. And it's because they said that the employers were like, if you don't do it, we're going to switch to somebody else who will. Um, many other insurances had already done it. United Healthcare was going to be the first one to roll it out on the medical benefit because that is harder for them to police. On the pharmacy side, they can see at the point of sale who's paying it. Even if you have a debit card from a manufacturer, that may not look like a copay assistance card, there's a way through those numbers that they have been able to identify some of those. I don't know how, but when they swipe it or whatever, they have some way to identify them. So in that case, they are able to then reset the members out of pocket to only reflect what they pay. And by the way, they refer to your out of pocket as your accumulator. So that's why it's called an accumulator duster. So. Great. Well, I think you just hit about nine grand slams there. So congratulations. Um, if you have additional questions, I'm going to pause there and let you take over and then we can ask them at the end. Okay. So we have here a patient and we're just going to go through the scenario. And for the sake of this example, we're going to make it really, really simple. John Doe has no other expenses for this calendar year except his clotting factor. He's on a high deductible health plan. His deductible is $5,000 and that's also his max out of pocket. So once he hits his deductible, the company or the insurance plan pays the full amount. His monthly hemophilia drug is 20,000 and he does use a, a product that has a $15,000 manufacturer copay card. So before there was accumulator adjusters and maximizers, this is how this scenario would look. John Doe would call his pharmacy in January and say he needs his clotting factor. The pharmacy would access the copay card. They would take $5,000 from that copay card apply it towards his deductible that would have satisfied his out of pocket because it counted then. And so at that moment, his deductible, he would have shown a remaining deductible of zero. And from then on for the rest of the year, the plan would be responsible for the full amount. So once January was met, um, then from February through the rest of the year, you see every single month when he needed his drug, the, the insurer would pay the full 20,000 after that first month. So, Here's what happens when an accumulator program is implemented. So John Doe calls his pharmacy, says, I need my clotting factor. They take $5,000 off of that coupon card. Remember, it had $15,000 balance to pay down his $5,000 deductible. The insurers build the rest, the $15,000. Then they reset the member's accumulator to reflect only what he himself paid, which at that point was nothing, right? So he still owes $5,000. Usually, he doesn't even realize this happened. Because up until these were rolled out, remember, that counted and it was done. February, he calls for his meds. Unbeknownst to him, they're going to go back to the manufacturer card and take another $5,000 um, because the card had $15,000. They're going to reset his accumulator and they're going to show that he still owes 5000 
In March, they're going to take the last $5,000 off that card. The insurer will pay their $15,000. It still shows the member owes $5,000 because they reset as accumulator. So you see in April, here's where the clip is. Because in April, when he calls and says, I need to get my clotting factor, the pharmacy says, how will you be paying your deductible? And what do you mean by deductible? That was paid back in January. No, actually, you didn't pay that. And that, so that didn't count. And so they, they clearly now have collected the deductible three times, January, February, March. And now they want the patient to pay it again. So they want to collect that 5000 four times, right? And if in a fantasy land, because remember, go back to that slide that said dollars and cents don't add up. If somebody has 5000 that could pay it, great. They'll get their meds, and at the end of that month, it'll show that they have no remaining deductible the rest of the year. It'll be covered at 100%. But more than likely, they don't have the 5000 And so that's where you risk um, being non-adherent to your treatment. And I would argue, and I do argue, that what it's going to do for hemophilia patients, because they can't go without their meds. They may um, no longer be prophylactically infusing, but the minute they get a bleed, they're going to end up in the ER, the highest cost of care setting for an infusion, rather than being able to treat at home. The worst thing that could happen right now during COVID, especially, but any time, and um, so that the, the unintended consequences are going to be very costly to both the payer and potentially the patient. And then I said I would tell you what a maximizer was. So the difference between accumulator and maximizer, they both will take the value of the manufacturer card, both examples. They both apply them, but don't count them to your out-of-pocket. However, with the maximizer, it requires them to do a plan amendment change. So they're only targeting a certain number of drugs, the really highest cost drugs, which hemophilia is on the list. And so they'll take all the drugs that are on the formulary and they'll say, let's just say you're on uh, XYZ product and you have a $15,000 manufacturer card, which I just showed you in the example. So they would divide that over 12 and they say, your copay for your hemophilia drug is now $1,250 a month. It's outside of your current plan, doc, deductible, et cetera. And so they'll take 1250 every month off your manufacturer card and that way you'll get your drug every month. There won't be that cliff where you may not get your meds, but that will never count to your um, out of pocket or your accumulator. So if you have some other costs or some other healthcare expenditures or other specialty meds or comorbidity, that is not gonna help anymore with your out of pocket um, ex exposure. So I wanna make sure and make that clear. Does that help clear the difference up between those two? Okay, so I'll let you guys ask more questions. Great, a couple more came in. But I, I wanna just go through the scenarios real quick. Sure. So the number one scenario was with no copay accumulator, no maximizer. The total cost to the patient that year, if it was just his meds, remember I said, we're gonna make this real simple. He just gets his meds. It would cost him nothing. It would cost the pharmaceutical 5,000 only. So even though they gave a $15,000 card, they didn't have to use all the card. And the total cost of the insurer in that scenario is 235,000 for the meds. And scenario two, this is when an accumulator is rolled out. So total cost to the patient, remember, because the plan paid five, or the manufacturer card was used three months, 5,000 each, and then the patient was expected to pay the 5,000. So 5,000 cost to the patient, 15,000 cost to the pharmaceutical card, $220,000 to the to the insurer. So you see, if they just look at something like this, they go, see, I'm going to save $15,000 by rolling this out on one member for one drug. And then if you look at the example with the maximizer, since the patient didn't have any other services, he would never have had to pay anything out of pocket, but he'd still owe that if he did. 15000 so they would have taken the whole manufacturer card, leaving the insurer to be exposed to 225000 So $10,000 savings if they went with that example over nothing. So you see why this looks promising um, to the insurers. But the unintended consequences are, I can assure you that hemophilia patients end up in an ER getting their meds. It's going to cost them a lot more on the back end. So I am going to stop the share and open it up for uh, any final questions.
All right, I have some additional questions for you. Um, is it true that accumulator adjusters are written into the majority of plans with the language indicating they can activate at any time? Mm -hmm. okay. They don't use the words accumulator adjusters. I showed you they call them different things, but even if it just says something as simple like our plan up until this year, um, NHF has United Healthcare um, and we're a fully funded commercial, so have no choice as a company, but they just rolled out the accumulator on our plan. We just got the notification and I just uh, explained it to our employees today. But it always said in the plan, um, you know, whatever it had your deductible, it had your co-pays, co-insurance, and it says what you pay out of pocket for your, so that was the word. So they could use that to say, it says what you paid. And that is all they need to say. So they use that as the way to implement it at any time. So they can, and they have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question is, how does the plan apply the cash from the manufacturer to their balance sheet? Well, you know, it depends on what, um, who's collecting. So in the case of the pharmacy benefit manager collecting, it's, if it's a self-funded employer, I mean, the, the pharmacy benefit manager is making something. One, they're making money on the factor. And then two, they're making some money off that card because they're implementing the benefits for that company. But the insurer, as you saw in that example, paid less than if there was no accumulator. So it looks like the insurer saving the money there. If it's a fully funded plan, that means the insurance is taking the risk. They would be theoretically saving the money. But when it comes to high cost life and death, treatments for diseases like hemophilia, um, my very first uh, instinct when this started back in end of 2016, which was going to roll out for plan year 2017, is that we would have unintended consequences. And it was immediate that it started to come to fruition. We have one member in that very first year, 2017, this has been in the Wall Street Journal. In fact, um, I did an article with the wife of this patient who, for two years prior to the accumulator, he was a mild, he only used clotting factor as needed. Um, he, was, he was on demand, he wasn't profi. He spent 80, I wanna say 86,000, I could be off a few dollars in the two years prior, um, or his insurance paid $86,000 on his treatment for the two years prior to the accumulator. Post accumulator, he went 40 days without clotting factor. He was having a knee bleed, he couldn't get his meds and it, he had, ended up with a hip bleed, a colon bleed, he was bleeding um, without resolution into his hip and knee, developed target joint. He ends up, the day we actually got this resolved, um, because we were working on this literally night and day for that period of time. When we finally got resolution, um, he, was admit, he passed out at work. He was admitted. He had multiple surgeries. He takes high-dose clotting factor now daily, twice a day, to eradicate the target joint. And in two years since the accumulator, it's cost the plan $3.5 million dollars from 86,000 before. So um, I would argue all day long that this is gonna have some severe unintended consequences that they're not thinking about. And so those are the examples. If you have a plan that implements it at, or your employer, I wouldn't go to them. I recommend you don't go to them and say, this is gonna make my quality of life bad and I may need to quit because this isn't good. Because when companies find out that they're gonna um, not have to pay the kind of claims they currently pay for you, they probably aren't going to cry over it. And I don't mean that negatively. I'm being just honest. Okay. Especially if you're in any sort of a service industry type of role, um, because companies like Walmart, Cracker Barrel, they're saying, we don't care. We don't care if they leave. Um, but other companies who do care about employee retention, that would work potentially with them. I don't know the difference. I suggest that if you do go to your employer, you say things like, I can't live without my medication. So this is gonna force me into the highest cost of care setting, the ER to get my clotting factor infusions. And I'll be going there, you know, X amount of times a week, which is gonna cost you 10 times more. Um, you need to talk about what it's gonna cost them too, not just what it would cost you. Great, thank you. Uh, another question that um, came in via private chat here is, um, I'm, I'm gonna summarize this. Right now is open enrollment um, and many are looking at the plans and juggle them. 
what is some language to look out for? And is there cautionary language that may sound um, like it's in the patient's best interest or, or a, you know, navigating open enrollment right now for certain plans? You know, I've had multiple uh, HTCs or social workers or folks reach out and say, can you just look at these and see if you see that language? Because it won't specifically say accumulator adjustment. But almost all of them will have a certain language. Um, let me see if I can pull this the recent plans that were just sent. Um, okay, I'm just gonna pull that up. Oh, I gotta go to share my screen. Hang on a second. Okay, so um, so this um, patient had his HTC reach out and ask about whether or not I could see anything in this plan. So he gave me four options to look through. But if you look here in just the benefit summary, lifetime max, coinsurance, uh, deductible, there was no deductible, that's a good thing. Um, because if you're on something like a PPO or one of these really robust plans and there is no deductible and you only have, let's say, even if it's 150, 250, the top tier for your medications, if you don't have coinsurance or deductible, then you could theoretically use that copay card that's worth 15000 It would last you all year. It may not apply to your out-of-pocket, but you're still going to get your meds. But in this case, look at here, plan out-of-pocket max. All benefit copays contribute towards your out-of-pocket max. Covered expenses that count to your out-of-pocket max include customer paid coinsurance and charges after each elder. So it uses that kind of language, and there's somewhere else on here where it says the amount you paid. It'll, it'll use that. So even though they may not specifically say this plan has a copay accumulator adjuster, they absolutely um, – I want to find this other. Can you still see this one? Yes. The amount you pay for out of network network covered expenses towards your out of, uh, your own your out of your out of network deductibles benefit copays always apply. Um, those are the kind of things you would look for. So I would put in, like if you can get this in an electronic format, do the search find and look for copays, out of pocket. Um, some of them specifically will use that terminology um, that says the amount only that you pay, but others will be more gray and that's where they can either implement it or don't have to. They have the language in there so that they can do it should they choose to at any, um, sorry, there's a bug in my face, but. So here's one. This is a this to me is a for sure. Only the amount you pay for in-network covered expense counts to your in-network deductible. So don't have the words accumulator adjuster, but that's very clear to me that this has an accumulator adjuster on it. But the other one is more vague, and that's because it gives them the latitude to roll it out should they determine to. Great. This is this is helpful. As I know, this could be extremely overwhelming as you get these notices this time of year about. Yep re-enrolling, picking a new plan, trying to navigate this. Um, yeah. That's, I think, where your drink is going to come in handy that you're going to give us the recipe yep. for. Um, yep. Yeah, and I would, again, I would just remind you, you're going to get options. Almost everyone has options. Um, you can get, and now some companies only offer high deductible health plan options. You may get two or three different high deductible health plan options, like one has a $1,500 deductible, one has a $3,000 deductible, one has a $5,000. The higher the deductible, the lower the out-of-pocket. Because remember, the lower the deductible, the higher the out-of-pocket. So you want to look at, if I have an option, a high deductible health plan, yes, I may save money in my premium. But they're almost surely, the high deductible health plans are almost surely going to have a copay accumulator on them. And the more robust plans, like the PPOs and the EPOs, they may be more money in premium. But if they don't have an accumulator, or if you have no deductible and no coinsurance, it's it really not going to impact you even if they do end up implementing the accumulator. So you have to make the decision. Can I afford this? If my out of in network deduct like this guy here, um, his deductible individual 500 family, a thousand, his max out of pocket, um, that's his out of network deductible. His max out of pocket is uh, 4,000 and 8,000. So 
you know, again, you have to say, if I did have to, if I am exposed to that, can I handle that? Because if not, you may want to go with a little higher premium and then maybe see if PSI or somebody has some premium assistance if you're eligible and that could help you um, pay the difference in the cost as well. PSI, PAN Foundation, um, all have assistance. And by the way, PAN Foundation, Patient Advocate Foundation, I think I said this already, and the Assistance Fund, if you get assistance from any of those for your co-pays, um, specifically about this co-pay accumulator stuff, to date, every plan has agreed that they would count that assistance to your, to your out-of-pocket, um, even if they have an accumulator duster in place because that money's coming from a third party nonprofit, not specifically directly from a manufacturer, even though the manufacturer is the one who fund those programs. And Colette, to piggyback on that, so say patient X mm -hmm. has an accumulator adjuster that's hit and it's a manufacturer card where it would come through the manufacturer itself. Mm -hmm. They could hypothetically apply to the PAN Foundation. Do all the pharmaceutical companies that currently have FDA products for bleeding disorders have or give to the PAN Foundation? No, um, and that's the other no. thing you can do. As a community, talk to the uh, manufacturers and tell them until we get these things under control that yes, I understand if I were them, I would wanna keep control of this money and, and be able to dole it out um, to my patients using my product, right? Because the risk is if I put the money in PAN, let's just say I'm XYZ company and I put the money in PAN Foundation and now patient who's on ABC product wants money, he could theoretically get the money I donated so it wouldn't even go to my product. Well, that's the way life goes because if I make a donation to American Cancer Society, anybody can use my money that I donate. I can't just say it's only for me and my family. So um, that's why uh, insurers will accept that towards your out-of-pocket. So uh, right now, PAN Foundation, the last I checked last week was open for funding um, the other two I mentioned, Assistance Fund and uh, a Patient Advocate Foundation, were currently closed, meaning they don't have current funding. But we need to remind manufacturers to continue to support those programs as well, um, because those can be the lifeline um, for, for many folks. It's a good ask there, um, and, and a good reminder about that as well. Um, a couple more questions. I know we're past eight, but I want to get through um, these uh, here is um, the, I'm just scrolling back. So HR 767, thank you, Miriam from HFA, um, their recent virtual Hill Day. Yes. It was, a, it, w will this be a priority for Washington Days next year as one of the asks? If I have anything to do with it, it will be, yeah. <laughs> awesome. And Miriam put the link in there and I know Nancy, you just did it super thank easy. Thank you, Miriam. Um, that you can uh, call on your local, uh, your, your federal, elected officials and ask them to support this. Um, another question, I'm just scrolling here. Where can I find the article about the about impact of copay accumulators that you mentioned? Did you say it was in the Times? Um, oh, on the patient that I mentioned? Well, there's um, a podcast. Um, uh, what's his name that does the podcast? I'm going to start blank. I believe Digi, um, Patrick Lynch. If you like search Ask the Expert Accumulator Adjuster and my name, you'll see that one. And the wife is in that. Um, she's um, also in that podcast. It was also written by um, um, Emma Court from Mar uh, Wall Street Journal Market Watch did um, uh, an article on it. So again, you can search um, either of those to find her. I can send you the links to Rich and you can share them. Yeah, I think I just found it. Um, but I'll ask you another question as I scope through this here. Mm -hmm. um, this is the last question that came in that I see. Um, so if you have another one, please shoot it over. Um, an ACA plan where the accumulator is written in but not activated, uh, the patient calls the payer informed there is no accumulator adjuster currently. Could the payer then activate the accumulator adjuster halfway through the plan year? Well, they don't usually do it, but I'm sure, and Miriam can, if you've heard something different, but I, I, I know that here's an example. Indiana, we had the HTC there call me uh, last year when the NBPP was walked back. I told you about that they had issued. Um, the HTC called and said that they had a couple plans on the marketplace who were now saying that they were implementing the copay accumulator mid-year 
It was always in the plan. They just hadn't rolled it out. But now they were forced to because it was against um, uh, the ACA and HHS uh, IRS guidelines. So I sent a letter to CMS, CSIO, and asked for that clarification because I knew that wasn't true. And they responded that no, they do not have to implement a copay accumulator. So we were able to use that to get them to pull, pull back um, from implementing it mid-year. But they have tried it. Perfect, great. Thank you, Colette. Um, I don't see any other questions, but I want to give it another uh, couple of seconds here. If you do have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. And while we're waiting for that, Colette, any uh, final words of wisdom as we navigate into 2021, the unknown here? Mm, no. <laughs> Other than, I mean, I just appreciate taking um, your evening to listen um, to this, what I think is an important message. I hope that you remain. I saw the numbers seemed to be pretty um, high that hadn't been impacted. I hope it continues to stay that way um, for you and your family. But um, there are ways that we can, um, you know, work on this together and just uh, supporting Rich and, and Neha, which is, you know, one of the most um, uh, forward thinking, uh, amazing chapters out there. Um, so I think you're, you guys are in good hands and, and um, we're here as a resource at NHF and, and my colleague Miriam at HFA. Um, so there's a lot of folks out there um, fighting on behalf of this community. Good folks. So. Well, I want to say thank you, Colette, for your dedication on a national level because I hear quite a bit of your name being floated around on other coalitions. So thank you for all your hard work. Um, that you continue to do on this and for spending your evening with us. I know that you're extremely busy and we certainly appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, and, and I know in New England, um, I saw it's very preliminary, so I don't wanna jump the gun, but there is a Massachusetts potential bill yeah. um, that will be introduced. Connecticut had one, it will probably be reintroduced um, I, COVID stopped everything. I mean, there was step therapy, there was all these bills that everything got paused in the budget and COVID relief. Um, Rhode Island, as Colette said, um, is a priority. And I heard rumblings, New Hampshire. Did you hear that? Possibly could be introducing one yep. too. That yep. leaves Vermont and Maine. We haven't forgot you, Vermont and Maine, but I think that as Colette said, it's up to the states now um, to, to really take ownership of this. And as we saw in Massachusetts with the um, sunset provision on the manufacturer assistance. These are very, it's like the stepdaughter, right? Or the stepchild to, you know, each other. It's different, but I also think that the study in Massachusetts from the HPC said manufacturer programs are necessary for patients. That's really what one of the big messages that came out when this went yep. to study. So I think Overall, whether it's adjuster, maximizer, the sunset provision in Massachusetts, these programs are essential to patients, period. Um, yep. So however that we can all work together to make sure that this is a reality is, is, is super important. Yep, it's 100%. So, and Great. I, as I said, I'm here and happy to answer any questions. Great, awesome. Well, I just wanna, before we head out, um, I put the link in the chat. We are not done with um, programming this year. So I just want to highlight a couple of more things. Our holiday parties this coming Saturday with the Hemophilia Alliance of Maine and Connecticut Hemophilia Society. Um, even if you missed the deadline to get gingerbread cookies and gifts for kids under the age of 12 and some other surprises, you can still join. We have a lot of surprises. Our MCs are actually in Hawaii. So there may be some elf related uh, looks of Hawaiian uh, flair going on and some good entertainment. Um, they are Cirque du Soleil performers, so you're in for a oh. treat there. Um, Sunday is our uh, holiday cookie extravaganza with the Gateway Hemophilia Association. So we're making whoopie pies, and I think it's called a gooey cookie out in the Midwest, um, but the whoopie pies is what we're in for. Next week, next Wednesday, we have wrapping up the new year um, that is uh, supported by HFA. 
Um, and it's with the Connecticut Hemophilia Society. We have a great um, uh, psychologist that's been uh, on NEHA webinars many times, Gary McLean. And then we have a special presentation about how to wrap the most perfect gift by Michael de Grand Prix. So it'll be very entertaining and you don't wanna miss that. Um, our last webinar is December 16th and it's with CSL Bearing and it features Perry Parker, who is a pro golf um, golfer who talks about how he turned um, stumbling blocks into stepping stones, but we're going to play cahoots that night. So it's a family friendly holiday cahoots. If you haven't played before, it's trivia and you get to be interactive and it'll be fun and there'll be music as we end the year. So with that said, thank you so much, Colette.